Hello everyone and welcome back to another video with On Point Politics and today we're going to be looking at what is the Electoral College? What is the system that the Founding Fathers created back in the 1700s? How is the system you know, adapted to US politics and where kind of the origins of it comes from? So guys, make sure to hit the like button and to subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. And so the Electoral College is a system where the president is selected through. Most countries have a national popular vote system where they just count up the ballots nationally and the person with the most votes wins, but that's not how the United States works. And this is for people that are into politics, but also don't really understand. And this is what this video is basically for if we see here the electoral college is a system that is used to pick the president based on the state and you see each state has a certain number of points or what they are called electoral college votes the way these are basically decided upon is we also have the legislative branch which has the house and the senate and what they do is they basically have the House of Representatives, which is basically decided upon based on the state's population. So depending on how many people are in a state, we actually see that they'll have more than others. For example, Wyoming has only three electoral votes because about 500,000 people or so live there. The state of California has 50, 54 electoral college votes because there is a lot of people there, possibly around 25 to 30 million people in the state of California. And so that is the state with the most electoral college votes. And what they do is they have all of the House representative numbers added up, and then they give two more electoral votes to every single state based on the amount of senators there were. And this was decided through the three-fifths compromise. And the way this was basically done was pretty much to basically incorporate both systems because if they would have done it through the Senate, they would have thought, hey, it wouldn't have made sense for Wyoming to have a better you know, say than California, even though California had more people. But then if they would have done it strictly through the House Representatives method, it would have been like, oh, California's gonna outpower Wyoming. So they kind of settled on this compromise to add both Senate seats to each of the states and then add all the House Representative you know, numbers as well. And this is where you get that where, you know, California has the most, Texas, Florida are the second and third most populated states in the nation. And then right at fourth is the state of New York. And every single 10 years, we have something called the U.S. Census, where we basically go ahead and basically ask people, okay, are you living here? And what they do is they then redistrict all the districts. They redraw the districts depending on how many there are. You know, gender gerrymandering is also a process where districts are drawn in a certain way to benefit certain political parties but that'll be for another video you know usually when a state gains or loses a representative in the house that's when you'll see the electoral votes drop and that can be caused by a drop in population so if we go back all the way to 1960 where kennedy got 309 electoral college votes to nixon's 220 and even bird a dixie crowd ended up narrowly winning mississippi which is interesting but if you look new york actually has to used to have the most electoral college votes it used to have you know 45 electoral college votes back in 1960 california was at 32 electoral votes texas and florida didn't have as many electoral votes as they did before and so those states have less electoral power than they did before but look at pennsylvania pennsylvania had 32 electoral college votes it was almost as influential of a you know place as a state like California and even Illinois had a lot more electoral college votes because what's happened is in the Northeast you know obviously if we go all the way back to the 1700s you're clearly going to see most people in the United States were situated out of the northern east and that's why states like ohio had more pennsylvania had a lot more new york uh virginia this is when they used to be a combined state with west virginia as well these are kind of this is back when virginia and west virginia used to be a single state you see they add up to 23 but even now it wouldn't even add up to 23 i think the state would probably add up to like 14 electoral votes if they were still together even tennessee had about 15 so you see most people were kind of situated in the northeast but what ended up happening as we kept expanding to the west and what basically ended up happening is these older kind of republican voters kind of started moving down to the south and they kind of started replacing 
the, you know, sort of old fashioned Democrats, you know, because the Democrats, you know, were for slavery. That was a big thing. The KKK started because of the Democratic Party. And so over time, we've kind of had those northern, you know, Republicans that voted for Abraham Lincoln. That generation kind of started moving down, you know, to the south. And that's why a lot of states have become more Republican as time has gone on. And abortion has really energized that base in the south as well. And we even see, you know, population centers that are really, really large, like places like New York, Chicago. A lot of these, you know, urbanized, you know, black populated areas or even not necessarily black but a lot of minority minority populated areas tend to have you know a state that's very blue because they kind of control the voting power of the state so california used to be somewhat competitive i mean the last time it went republican was back in 1988 when it voted for bush by three points but the state back then was nearly not as you know minority you know populated as it is now back then the state must have been 80 90 percent white now it's probably not even that it's probably like maybe 50 60 not even it may even be hispanic majority at this point and that's why certain states that are more democrat tend to have more bigger population sizes and the reason why i'm bringing this up is because a lot of people seem to be confused especially with the donald trump elections example in 2016 clinton won the popular vote by two points but donald trump still won, won the electoral college and a lot of people you know there's a big debate on whether the electoral college or the popular vote should be the right system but the reason why this happened is because california and new york went to clinton by 30 points in california and 23 points respectively in the state of new york and since those are the two states that went to the democrats by so much they basically inflate the margin and you see Texas and Florida, yes, they went to Donald Trump, but they went to Donald Trump by way lesser margins than did a state like California or New York. If Texas and Florida had gone to Donald Trump by the same margins that New York and California did, Trump would have probably ended up winning the state of New York. And the founding fathers kind of developed the electoral college this way because there is a kind of concept they had of a major basically avoiding the majority mob essentially kind of avoiding the rule of the mob majority essentially this is a kind of thing that the founding fathers were scared of that if a certain party were to get in just strictly through the popular vote they would kind of just control politics for years and years to come and what the electoral college does is it gives each individual state a certain voting power that you would not have otherwise if you had a strict popular vote if the electoral college did not exist california texas florida and new york would basically be deciding all of our presidential elections and states like wyoming would have no say at all and states like vermont wouldn't even have no say at all or even rhode island massachusetts and it's funny because now democrats are obviously now that trump won democrats are in favor of getting rid of the electoral college but funny enough states like vermont massachusetts rhode island new jersey maryland states that they typically win virginia you know states that they're like oh no look now we're winning them now now they're blue it wouldn't matter anymore those states would not matter at all in the presidential elections because if new york california you know basically end up going a certain way for each candidate they would really be the states that the political candidates would go to none of those states would be getting any attention at all new jersey donald trump went there very recently a couple months ago because the polls showed it close so he was like oh let me go there and you can see the state only has 14 electoral votes and you know obviously florida texas new york and california have a lot more so in a popular vote system you would be prone to only going to those but now that donald trump or at least now that the electoral college exists donald trump is okay so the polls are close to new jersey i'm going to go there that wouldn't have happened otherwise if the electoral college wouldn't have exist so even if not every single state is getting attention you're still having candidates go to different places like harris is going to pennsylvania michigan nevada arizona illinois virginia she's going to florida she's going to atlanta like she's going to many different places that she wouldn't be going to if the popular vote would be deciding if that was the case she'd be just she would basically just be spam rallying in california and new york because that's how the election would effectively be decided at that point and Donald Trump would probably be going to Texas, Florida, maybe would go to like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, like maybe he would go there. Funny enough, it's actually quite funny, but 
Trump probably ends up winning the popular vote this year. And so, you know, Democrats saying they want to abolish the Electoral College wouldn't really be the smartest thing because Florida has actually trended so far to the right the past couple of years in Ohio and Iowa have. And some of these red states are going to get redder this year to the point where they really can't rely on the you know popular vote being the factor that decides for them. And so that is also an interesting analysis there as well. And we also kind of have the fact that this kind of gives states their own voting power. For example, in 2016, a lot of voters were disappointed with Barack Obama's policy with TPP, which kind of drove a lot of jobs away in the Rust Belt. And if it wasn't for the Electoral College, those voters wouldn't have had a say in the election because Clinton would have won the popular vote, it would have been over. But since we have the Electoral College, each state's individual needs are highlighted in the electoral system that we have created. And that's why, in my opinion, the Electoral College is a superior system to a popular vote because each individual states get to vote on the concerns that they have for the presidential election. And so because we have the Electoral College and the fact that we had the TPP policies that were hurting auto workers in these states, we basically had Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania narrowly go to Donald Trump, which helped him win the Electoral College. But if it was not for that, the popular vote would have gone to Clinton. The same thing if we go back to, you know, 2008, you know, clearly we see, you know, Obama won in an Electoral College landslide and here it wouldn't have really mattered. But even like in 2000, right, we see a state like Florida barely went to George W. Bush. If it wasn't for the Electoral College, Al Gore would have technically won the election here. But you see most of Al Gore's support is concentrated in the Northeast. And so if the popular vote would basically be deciding the election, basically all of Florida's very close election barely going for Bush wouldn't have mattered and they necessarily wouldn't have really had a say because that state wouldn't have really netted any candidate votes. Same thing for Wisconsin, Iowa, New Mexico, and Oregon. All of these swing states wouldn't really have any influence in the elections if the popular vote was the way we would do things because of the fact that they wouldn't really sway the election one way or another. States like Missouri or California, Texas or Florida, New York would technically get more attention because of the fact that those would be the ones really swaying the election. But now with the Electoral College, candidates have to go to Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, and California. And so more people technically get noticed that way with the Electoral College. And one more thing I want to talk about about the Electoral College, which is very interesting, is something called the Three-Fifths Compromise. And a lot of people have said, oh, the Founding Fathers were racist for this. You know, there's no way, you know, this is something that should have been, never happened. But I'm gonna explain this in a way where it makes sense to everybody and why it actually ended up benefiting us in the long run in terms of getting rid of slavery. So the way that this was formed, right, is back, you know, all the way when the Constitution was developed, the Three-Fifths Compromise basically was, okay, well, you know, there were certain people that didn't agree with slavery, some people that did, and the people that didn't agree with slavery say, okay, well, if you're basically counting that person that you call a slave as property, they shouldn't count as a person at all because you're going to use those people to politically benefit you to count them as an actual person but not even treat them as one and then obviously the people that were for slavery were like no we don't like that so what they ended up doing is they basically did it to where they basically counted a slave as three-fifths of a person and it sounds messed up at first but what you realize is that looking at the electoral college what happens now is states, especially in the South, that had a lot of slaves to the point where sometimes it would make up like 30, 40 percent of the population. They didn't have as much power in influencing the elections as the states in the Northeast did. And to be honest, if you would have had equal power in these states, you know, as the Northeastern ones at that point, you would have had a lot of Democrat presidents come out of the South that would have probably, you know, opposed getting rid of slavery. And the electorate would have been a lot different compared to today. If they would have had more voting power, you would have probably still had and possibly would have gone away. But 
the environment would have been a lot different because it probably would have taken a little bit longer to get rid of slavery by that point and so counting slave as three-fifths of a person at first seems you know not humane it actually ended up benefiting the future generations because those states typically run by you know white men that wanted to keep their slaves didn't have as much electoral influence in the presidential elections and at that point effectively amendments were passed and the president has to be the one that signs it and so that was a really really big problem for the south at that point at that point their electoral viability had basically shrunken because at that point the democrats essentially became a regional party and after at a certain point they kind of started coming back after a while but once after 1860 or at least after 1864 the three-fifths compromise didn't really even matter anymore because at that point slavery was basically gone and so at that point you saw the electoral votes in these states ended up shooting up quite a bit because now they're counting everybody as a full person and now that slavery is gone it's like okay now that that's gone i mean now you get to have more electoral power but the people who opposed slavery were kind of geniuses to be honest because they were able to kind of do it in a certain way to where it's like okay we're going to count them as a certain person but not to try to basically deflate the electoral power that the people had in the south so that their policies wouldn't get implemented and i know there's a lot of people that were confused about that and i first learned about this in history class but when you actually kind of look at it and you hear an explanation how i explained it it makes a lot more sense now because it, you would think like why would they not count them as a full person but it actually ended up benefiting the future generations because of the fact that certain democratic presidents weren't able to get elected through the south you even see here like for example taylor and cass if you would have had more electoral power in texas and certainly southern states cass cut a gun close to winning the presidential election polk ended up getting in here you saw van buren was able to kind of win as well and so that is kind of there's a lot of elections where if the southern you know area would have had more power you could have possibly seen things go astray quite a bit even here for example if you would have combined all of the electoral college votes between the three different candidates that basically split up because they weren't happy with the democrat party nominee if you would have added all of those votes up you would have ended up having a way closer election with lincoln and if those states would have had electoral votes more counted because of the slaves that they had one of the democrat candidates would have won and abraham lincoln wouldn't have been president of the united states and so that's basically the explanation for the three-fifths compromise and so now with the electoral college this is kind of a generic you know battleground map and this is a concept called swing states which change over time because if you see here back in 2004 you're going to see that you know obviously new mexico or iowa wisconsin were kind of the toss-up states even colorado was a toss-up before and ohio was nevada was oregon was those were more toss-ups anything that was basically decided by under five points i can even basically fill these in for us to be able to really see what the battlegrounds were effectively but this is basically every single state that is in the lighter shade of red or blue those are the states that were effectively the toss-ups and if you go to 2000 the toss-up states are completely different so over time you know certain things demographics kind of work itself out and we have different swing states and again if you had the popular vote the popular vote you wouldn't really have any swing states because the states with the most populations would just be deciding all the elections and so over time because we have the electoral college different states get to have the chance at picking the president based on the issues that are going on at that time the reason why the rust belt started trending to the republicans is mainly because of donald trump being really good on trade issues that certain union workers and certain ancestral democrats favored that older democrats used to favor as well and they kind of really stopped and so that really punishes the you know democrats up there in the rust belt but if you look at the sun belt democrats have been gaining in arizona and georgia mainly because donald trump wasn't necessarily appealing 
to those voters. So it's like, okay, at that point, you know, the Republicans are punched in the Sun Belt. And I'm not saying that in a literal sense, like, oh, they, they should be, the Republicans should be punished for nominating Trump. But you'll see, like, different things end up benefiting different parties at certain points. And it kind of allows different states at certain points to have a say in the electoral process, where if you just had the popular vote, basically all the states with the most population would be deciding the electoral college or the presidency, like I've said before. And so that is basically the whole video explaining the electoral college, how it works, how it was created and whatnot. I'm going to be filling out a battleground map for you guys to see. I am not going to be going into my predictions for this video as this was merely an educational video to explain the electoral college and where it comes from and how it works. But essentially, this is kind of an expanded battleground map for this year. If you took every single state that was decided by basically decided by around 10 points or less in the last election, this is basically what you have now. So the states that you need to be looking out for this year would be Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Nebraska, 2nd Congressional District, Maine at large, and New Hampshire. And before we end off, I actually want to talk about Nebraska and Maine because they do things a little bit differently. And a lot of people have gotten confused about this too. If you notice back in the 1960s, you know, they were basically, oh, once a candidate won all of the states, you basically ended up getting all the electoral votes but maine and nebraska having a certain political system decided to do something called split electoral votes and what they do is they basically decide it by congressional districts so you know how a congressman runs in a certain district what they do is they add up the tally of the presidential votes in certain districts and whoever would win that district would get that electoral vote and what's interesting is that before it wouldn't really matter because the candidate who would be winning it roughly got all the electoral votes. But in 2008, Omaha, that district, Nebraska second, where Omaha and Nebraska is, that went to Obama. So it's like, okay, now that individual town or city gets a say in the electoral college. A lot of people want to pass a congressional-based electoral college system, which it's not a perfect system, but I think the Electoral College is superior to a popular vote. And I think something of congressional districts, it's a little bit iffy because, again, a lot of those are drawn to benefit certain political parties. So, you know, really comparing those is a little bit weird in a way, in my personal opinion. I don't really think that that would be the superior way of doing it. And you even see Maine at large kind of all voted together. Donald Trump is the first Republican to have won Maine's second congressional district without winning the other two. And you see Maine's first, Maine's second, and then the last two electoral votes. Presumably the electoral votes added up from the senators are the only electoral votes that you could win at large here. And you see that that could go to the candidate who wins the entire state as a whole. And so that is basically it for this video, guys. If you guys did enjoy this video of me explaining the Electoral College, make sure to hit the like button and to subscribe for more content just like this. I am planning on doing more timeless videos like this, kind of explaining certain parts of American politics and things like that, and maybe even going over previous elections. So if you guys have any suggestions in the comment section, make sure to go ahead and put those down as well. And I will see you guys in the next video.